So thank you very much for that introduction. Indeed, my name is Nick Fahey. Um, I'm based here at Oxford in the Department of Primary Care, working on a wide range of issues related to policy and innovation and change in health systems. Um, formerly, I have been a policymaker for many years, working for the British and European governments. Um, and I'm going to draw on some of that in this presentation. So what I want to talk about indeed is to sort of to, to move, to take us out a level really. In fact, I'm going to take us out three levels. So we've been talking about some quite technical and quite specific detail around personalised and genomic medicine. Um, what I'd like to do is, is, is introduce you to some broader challenges that this raises for the health system as a whole, um, for the country as a whole, actually, uh, and then the whole model of how innovation and development works in this area. So, because when we talk about personalised and genomic medicine, putting this into practice raises challenges which go across the entire health system. Uh, it, this isn't just a question of how we technically establish the value, either perceived or, or through other uh, means, as was just being discussed in, the, in some of the previous presentations of personalised medicine, but how those engage with, with broader societal challenges. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, infrastructure within the health system. Uh, trigger warning, I'm going to talk about Brexit. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I'm going to talk about some challenges to the, the fundamental model of how we develop medicines that, that are represented by personalised and genomic medicine. So, um, infrastructure. How long do you think it should take to introduce a new information technology system w into healthcare? <coughs> Any guesses? You've all got your smartphones and your smart devices. You know how quickly all these apps get updated. So how, how long, for example, let's take a really simple one. Let's take electronic prescriptions. How long should it take to put in place an electronic prescription system? Should it? Three years I have at the front. Anyone else? Any advances on three years? There's a, there was a depressed five at the back from someone who doesn't want, <laughs> someone who doesn't want to admit to it. Um, in, the English NHS, I mean, because let, let's think about this for a second, by the way. This is a very standardised form. All right, we know what goes on this form. We have identification of all the actors concerned. We have a formulary that describes all the potential things that might be put on that form. We have a very established, highly controlled supply chain. We have everything in place for a nice, simple IT solution, don't we? Very established. 17 years is how long the English NHS has been working on this, and it's still not fully in place. All right? So I just want to say that really to calibrate your expectations a little bit. Now think about what are the kind of informational changes, the informational systems that need to be in place to make good use of personalised and genomic medicine? Because you've discussed some of them earlier today, right? One of the key elements in this is the ability to draw on information. Now sometimes that will be information which you can, can gather directly during the process of care for your individual patient profiles. But part of the, certainly if we listen to the broader rhetoric about personalised medicine, part of it is about being able to link much bigger data sets with potential uh, targets for treatment and, and treatments, right? Both in terms of research and in terms of being able to accurately provide care. So I just want to have you that, for you to have that in mind when we talk about the gap between um, rhetoric and reality as far as this is concerned because underpinning personalised medicine from a systems point of view is a technological and systems change which is huge for the, a system like the NHS to put in place and unfortunately it's not even as good as starting from a blank sheet of paper um, starting from zero would be quite a good starting point actually in this context because of course we're not starting from zero the, NH, the National Programme for IT and the attempt to introduce an electronic health medical record for the NHS has been slightly unfairly described as a failure so big you can see it from space. Um, Care.IT, uh, the Care.data rather, network, showed a, a, a legacy of distrust about sharing of data and linkage of data 
that has begun to be established in the public's mind as regards healthcare and sharing data and information. So when it comes to making the case for sharing data and putting in place the IT infrastructure that we need to support the kind of innovations that are being discussed today, we're not even starting from zero. We're starting from a situation where the public are actually already slightly sceptical about the functionality of these systems and slightly sceptical about who they trust and who they don't trust in terms of sharing this information. So that's the first thing that I want to talk about. We could talk about more things. We could talk about the systems redesigns which are inherent in the changing care pathways that you might be putting in place. Um, we could talk about how long it's taken us to try and just get people who need to be discharged from hospital care to social care, uh, how long we've been trying to put that in place. Uh, if anyone has any good ideas, by the way, on how we can improve the link between hospital care and social care, please do suggest them in the questions afterwards, because we've been trying for the history of the NHS and we haven't managed it terribly well so far. So I just wanted to put that first thing in there. If you're working in a field which depends upon reuse and better use of personal data and information, you are depending upon a systems infrastructure which at the moment is not terribly well established. Now, the UK could decide to invest a great deal more in doing that. And that brings me to my second topic, which is Brexit. Um, now, it's very easy for those people who uh, aren't familiar with the European Union, um, which is by and large everyone, uh, at least as far as the detailed organisation and structures of the EU are concerned, um, to think that health is not primarily an issue as far as Brexit is concerned because health is not primarily an EU competence, right? Health is a national competence. If you read 101 textbooks on EU policies, what the European Union does, that's what you will read. And um, I have plenty of colleagues, even when I was working in the Commission, whose working assumption was that health isn't really a European issue. The problem with that is that health is a very large part of the economy. It's one of the largest single economic sectors within the economy. And therefore, if you have a European Union which is built around economic integration, it's going to touch lots of aspects of the health service. In particular, just to take a few, uh, the licensing and regulation of pharmaceuticals medical devices. So the diagnostics and the treatments that we've been talking about, those licensing processes are European law. Not health law, if you want to be legal about this, it then those laws aren't actually health laws, they're not based on health provisions of the treaty, they're based on internal market provisions of the treaty. They're about enabling the free movement of goods and services within the EU, but their central impact is on health and health services. The, rec the mutual recognition of professional qualifications, again a free movement question, but it relates directly to the staff that are available in the NHS, the current issues of staffing um, both within the NHS and within higher education, science and research. So we looked at, and if anyone is interested, uh, we did, um, some colleagues and I did a piece in The Lancet on uh, the impact of Brexit on health and health systems, health and health care within the UK. And I will summarise the messages for you. Essentially, it, we use the WHO's structure of the key building blocks of health systems, and we looked at each of these key building blocks of health systems. And if you look across those key building blocks of health systems, every single one is going to be affected by Brexit. And as a simple description, the harder the Brexit, the worse the impact from a mildly negative impact in the case of a soft Brexit, for which we defined as being staying within the EEA, what's sometimes described as the Norway option, a fairly substantial impact in terms of if we were to have a hard Brexit, i.e. Canada style free trade agreement, or a truly catastrophic impact if we have no um, agreement at all and we crash out without an agreement between the EU and the United Kingdom where, as has been highlighted just this week, there is a genuine risk to continuity of supply of medicines and other essential provisions for the health service. So Brexit does have impacts on the health system. It also has impacts on the life sciences sector of the UK as a whole. It's unquestionable that life sciences and the higher education sector within the UK is one of the UK's national strengths. It's a, it's a huge competitive advantage. We are uh, disproportionately 
leading within Europe in terms of research in many of these areas, and a lot of the work here at Oxford is, is built on those kinds of collaborations and that kind of funding. Now, of course, plenty of countries in the world take part in research that aren't part of the European Union. But when you are trying to do research which covers in particular rare and specialised conditions, it is quite often quite helpful to have collaborations across different patient pools, different groups of researchers, and within an integrated legal network uh, structure for things like clinical trials, research governance, patents, intellectual property, all the rest of these kinds of things. So if we are not part of one of the globe's largest blocks of legal um, and policy infrastructure for research, but we sit right next to it, we cannot expect our existing life science leadership role to persist in the way that it does at the moment. And that leaves us to some, some interesting choices, because what do we do? Let's assume that Brexit happens. What should we do at that point? What choices can we make? The authors of the Life Sciences Strategy were very clear, and I'm also involved, I'm a specialist advisor to the House of Commons Health Select Committee for their inquiries on Brexit and the impact on health and social care, and in the evidence that's been given to the committee, and if you're interested, I'd encourage you to have a look at the reports. Uh, it was very clear the best option is that the UK remains as closely aligned with Europe as possible that we remain integrated in the research and development funding programmes, that we remain integrated within medicines licensing, that we remain functionally part <coughs> of this overall framework of policy, of regulation, of funding and of research. There is a problem with that. It is absolutely not the policy of the government. And it is incompatible with the red lines that the government has drawn. So let's assume that that doesn't happen and that we are outside. What do we do if we want to retain the United Kingdom as a leading place for research and application of personalised and genomic medicine, partly for the careers of everybody based in this room, but less directly selfishly because of the benefits that it brings to the population and the health service of this country? Well, you could make choices. You could, for example, say we're going to put in a very large amount of money into establishing the kind of information systems that we don't have at the moment in the NHS, but would help this kind of research. We could rewrite our data protection legislation to make it easier to, um, to create an implied social consent for the sharing of data in the public health interest, as opposed to requiring individual consent. We could create a different pathway for adoption and implementation of personalised medicine within the National Health Service to create an accelerated pathway and to support that with the kind of evaluation and data processes that would monitor that implementation and uptake. I'm sure you all have many other ideas, but this would be a big strategic shift by the country. It would require a national conversation about what do we want to do. And it would require quite major policy shifts and, and divergences from both the European Union and the United States. It would be a bet on personalised and genomic medicine as the future of healthcare and the positioning of the United Kingdom as the leading player in that by having designed its health service and its research structure in order to support that. That conversation isn't yet happening. We're all still very obsessed about you know, this week's cabinet split and whether or not the government is going to lose another vote in the House of Commons, um, answers on a postcard. Uh, but I would encourage you to think beyond that. Think beyond the circus of the next year or even two years. Think about what would it mean for this country to decide that it wants to make personalised and genomic medicine part of what makes the UK NHS a unique and different place. Think also about what it means if we don't do that. If we're not aligned and we don't put that investment, where does that take us in terms of research and in terms of healthcare? Now, of course, it's difficult for any one country to make decisions about its overall strategy for drug development, for personalised genomic medicine, for any of these kinds of things. And this is my third topic. So having talked about the kind of infrastructure we have in the NHS, having talked about the Brexit and not just its consequences, but the strategic choices that we might make in response to it, let me talk about 
the fundamental challenge that personalised medicine presents to drug development and some of the context that this concerns. Because the current model of medicinal product development is based on, uh, I'm going to highlight three key features, uh, which are slightly controversial. Um, the first is that we spend colossal amounts of money on developing drugs, and we make that economic by spreading the cost of that development across as many patients as possible. So we aim, and, the and pharmaceutical companies and other developers aim to take their 500 million, or whatever figure the industry is currently citing, um, as development costs for their drugs, and having that licensed across as many people in as many countries and as many indications as you can possibly manage, right? Basic economics. If you've got high upfront costs, you want to pile it high and sell it cheap and get it out there as far as possible. Um, the problem with that is that there's a tension with personalised medicine. If the whole point of what you're doing is to have very targeted development and to not spread your therapies across large numbers of people, what do you do about your large upfront development costs? How do we share those? So there's a fundamental challenge there about what the current drug development model is, which is about spreading things as widely as possible in contrast to the model of personalised medicine, which is about targeting as narrowly as possible. Um, this is particularly the case in the context of the wider macroeconomic situation of most health systems in the world. Leaving aside the United States, and I will come back to the United States in a moment, because it's very interesting for another reason. Um, if we look at the health systems of Europe, we see a fairly consistent picture for European Union countries, certainly for the more developed markets, which is essentially, we have had consistently rising expenditure on healthcare for decades, since the establishment of broadly universal health systems, first thing, above average, above inflation and GDP rises in healthcare. So the proportion of national wealth spent on healthcare has been rising across these systems. Secondly, how have we been paying for this? I said rising faster than GDP. So how have we been paying for this? By a combination of three things, rising taxes, greater proportions of taxation going on to healthcare in different ways, rising debt. We've all got big amounts of public debt across Western Europe. And dividends from de um, decreases in other areas, and the two big dividends have been we don't spend as much on defence as we used to, and we don't spend as much on subsidies as we used to. So part of the corollary of the EU and the WTO is that we don't, we don't subsidise all our industries in quite the same way as we used to, and we also have been able to finance that through other areas. The problem is we are at probably credibility-limited levels of debt, no country has managed to sustainably tax more than about 50% of wealth, and we're at around about 42, 45, depending on what country you look at. And the dividends from defence have vanished, and if anything, are going to require more money in the future. So how do we fund this? Second, and I know I'm coming another, another two or three minutes. Um, so that's the first challenge. We're not in the same financial environment for the next 20 years as we have been for the previous 20 or 30 years. Second challenge, actually what we pay for doesn't drive the market. Those of you involved in development, where do you want to try and sell your new products? Where do you go? Where do you try and launch? The West, the West but specifically? US. US. Because the United States doesn't, open, uh, doesn't operate like any other country in the world. The United States pays for any incremental additional value in improving health, broadly regardless of what it costs, for the simple reason that the United States healthcare market isn't structured around get, making that accessible to everyone. It's structured around providing the best possible care to a small number of people who can afford it, broadly, and a much lower level of care to people that can't. That is not the structure of health systems in Europe or elsewhere around the world. But it does mean that the whole development process is oriented to this elephant, which is the US market, and not towards what we need. Why isn't it oriented towards what we need? Because we pay much less. We insist on careful value evaluations. We insist on careful health technology assessment and NICE and EQUIC and um, HIS. 
And that doesn't make nearly as much money. So the whole development model is skewed towards the country, which doesn't care about the values to overall publicly financed systems that we do. And related to that, and most fundamentally, as Mariana Mazzucato has set out, um, we have an interesting process of development at the moment, which is where we put a lot of public money in at the start of the process, in fundamental science, funding quite a lot of people in this room, I would imagine. And then we license that out to pharmaceutical companies, who then make a great deal out of money by selling that back to us, which we then pay for again through the public financing of healthcare systems. Now, in the context of the previous two points that I just described about financing, does that seem sensible to you? You know, we have we've carefully privatised profits but nationalised the costs of personalised medicine. And this is probably not overall sustainable. So in conclusion, I've talked about three specific things. About infrastructure for personalised medicine, the challenges that that presents. About the impact of Brexit and the choices that perhaps we need to make in that context. And about the fundamental challenges to resource allocation across society, not just within the health system, but across society and between societies that personalised and genomic medicine requires consideration of.